Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Matt is the founder of Hungry, a new multimedia platform examining the impact of technology on the way we eat. He's focused on massive shifts in consumer behavior ranging from fungi-based meat to ghost kitchens and robot-powered grocery stores. You can read his latest articles and watch the latest videos at Hungry.tv. That's H-N-G-R-Y dot TV. So Matt, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Just uh, I'm in LA, got out for a hike. Um trying to stay active amidst all the all the craziness but uh yeah keeping busy cool yeah I, I think i saw that you just uh, released a new video right lately i haven't watched it yet but i have uh, yeah. saved it into my queue so i'm excited to watch that one what's it about i did yeah it's about uh you know it's what i would call the next wave of alternate proteins um alternative proteins it's fungi based meat so mm -hmm. it's actually not mushrooms most <laughs> people think of fungi they think of mushrooms mushroom uh, mushrooms are a fungi mm. They are the fruiting bodies of of um, what is known as mycelium, which is this mm -hmm. uh, root-like structure that grows in the soil. And um, there's a new wave of entrepreneurs that are basically um, fermenting this stuff in these big bio-fermenters and close to the end consumer. And this stock is kind of examining, mm. you know, the future of uh, that industry that is, you know, kind of booming. And it's kind of the next wave of um, startups like Beyond Meat and Impossible mm -hmm. in the sense that um, the, the, these guys are trying to do whole cuts of, of meat Got and it. try to replicate everything from chicken to steak to seafood and poultry. Wow, fascinating. Well, we'll definitely, uh, I know I'll check that out and uh, leave a link to that in the show notes so people can take a look. Um, but, you know, the reason why I wanted oh. to have you on is because, you know, with the, you know, we're kind of in the midst of the pandemic here. I guess you could say, you know, we're, I, I guess I'll time it since uh, things are changing so quickly. We're here on May 26th, Tuesday. This episode will go out early next week. And, uh, you know, we're kind of in the midst of this pandemic. And one of the big topics of the pandemic has been the shift to food. Food delivery and you know the apps that power food delivery whether it's instacart but also you know more specifically the restaurant that side of things and you know as someone who kind of has studied this carefully and i guess just from uh, you know i haven't caught up with you in a while but it seems like uh, you've sort of taken this under your wing as i don't know if it's just a, a passion of yours or you know i've seen you writing about it more tweeting about it more but uh, in addition to all the other work you're doing what's your sort of background uh, there i mean so i try to cover topics that i think are going to be you know transformational to the food industry mm -hmm. and powered by technology. And I think, um, you know, restaurants are a huge part of the food industry. And I see the, the shift there um, more so than a lot of other verticals of food. So I've definitely, you know, and, and it was also kind of, you caught me kind of right as I was getting started on this path of um, building this media company. And, yeah. and, you know, I started with ghost kitchens as the primary focus initially and uh, have branched out, but it's still something that I'm keeping my ear to the ground. Um, I, I'm keeping my ear to the ground on it because it's just changing so rapidly and uh, it's you know something we gotta fix yeah. immediately. Yeah, definitely. No, a lot of uh, restaurants are out there uh, struggling right now in the midst of pandemic, you know, with obviously, of course, they can't do dine in and many shifting to to go orders only or pick up. Uh, I guess that's the same thing, but um, <laughs> for app delivery, uh, delivering themselves. And, you know, so I sent you uh, there was this sort of viral post from a reporter, I think she's at the New York Times, uh, Susie Cagle, or maybe, I don't know if she, she, she might be on her own now, um, but it was this pizza owner in Chicago and he tweeted out this <laughs> screenshot, which I know you've seen and probably a lot of other people have seen, but basically the gist of it was that, you know, they made around a thousand dollars and their cut after all was said and done was what, three or $400. So it's sort of a, yep. a ridiculous, you know, kind of a statement because there was, you know, like the income they brought in, then all these different fees. So, you know, that's sort of the first thing that I want to talk about. You know, there's this post, which, you know, I guess I'm going to ask you what you think about it. But in my, you know, we see this a lot of times with Uber and Lyft, there are certain maybe, you know, trips or certain months where there are outliers. And I'm assuming that, you know, uh, Grubhub isn't taking 60, 70% of every single <laughs> order that uh, definitely wouldn't be sustainable. But it is definitely a big issue right now for restaurateurs who, you know, traditionally, 
traditionally maybe only a small slice of their orders had been uh, you know on these apps and now it's a majority or 90 percent or 80 percent so i'm curious to know what you think about this situation and let's let's dig into the fees that these companies are charging yeah i mean i think it's absolutely you know they're preying on the weakness of restaurant owners and i'm spe speci specifically highlighting grubhub because yeah. i think it's so hard to parse out all the different well, I mean, uh, there's Grubhub, Postmark. I guess we'll, we'll generally, you know, we can talk yeah. specifically about companies, but we're, I guess when I say food sure. app delivery, Grubhub, Postmates, DoorDash, Uber Eats are sort of the All big of ones, right? Yeah. I mean, so as a whole, what are, you know, you're, you're asking what are, what are my thoughts on all the fees and its sustainability? For restaurants? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that, you know, we've seen a number of stories and, you know, I mean, basically just complaints, right, from restaurateurs that are saying, hey, these fees that these apps are charging are way too high. So what have you seen in your research mm -hmm. on the fees is, you know, was this Grubhub mm -hmm. case where an outlier, what, what are the average fees you've seen charging? I'm happy to share some of my thoughts, too. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, to break it down, pre-COVID, it was, you know, pretty much 15% um, for a pickup order mm -hmm. or an order where I was fulfilling it with my own drivers, I as a restaurateur, yeah. 30% for delivery. And, um, that's kind of your standard, um, breakdown. It, you can negotiate based on, you know, your size and the number of units you have. Um, mm -hmm. you know, an interesting stat is that Grubhub makes a, was making about $4 in contribution margin per order off of an independent restaurant and $0 on a, fast casual QSR restaurant. Mm. So it goes to show like the business model is just completely dependent on these mom and pops, which yeah. is totally unsustainable mm. if you're going to charge them all these high fees when they have no other, they have a, a lot less options right now. And so, uh, I think the whole model is broken, you okay. know, and I, and I've been saying this kind of, um, now more than ever, it's just, I think now is the time to really rethink the entire way that restaurants are going to play in this space. The need is growing and growing for, yeah. for delivery and off-premise, obviously. And But the means by which we were doing that were designed for a very different uh, set of constraints and gotcha. uh, and of overhead and everything. And, and I think we need to start from the ground up. Yeah. So you highlighted an interesting, you know, so obviously the trend right now, the, the need for food delivery and the demand there is growing big time, right? And, you know, coronavirus, I think, has only accelerated that trend. So restaurants are seeing huge demand right now. And like you said, that's interesting. You know, some for some restaurants, it actually sounds like this model is working, right? Um, maybe for the Chipotle's, you know, maybe for the, you know, like you mentioned, the fast casuals where they can actually, you know, I think Starbucks, for example, I ordered on Uber Eats the other day on Starbucks, and there was actually an option for me to share my information with Starbucks. And I know that's something that a lot of the independent mom and shop, mom and pop shops have complained about in the past is that when you place an order on one of these app services, um, you know, they have no idea who you are or what you're ordering and can't contact you in the future. So it sounds like the big boys basically do have some bargaining power. And for them, it, it may be, is, is the system working for them right now, you think? Um, yeah, I mean, I think Sweet Green, you know, had to deal with okay. Uber Eats where, you know, they were they weren't paying marketplace fees for those placements and mm. they were using Uber Eats to power all the delivery inside of the Sweet Green app. And I think under normal cir circumstances, they wouldn't be, you know, signing up to do this because they've probably run the numbers and realized that, you know. It just doesn't work unless you do an insane amount of volume and then you prove that it's incremental. Who, who wouldn't so be that's, doing it? Sweet green. Okay. I don't think uh, under a normal circumstance that they would be um, mm. so eager to jump on the Uber Eats bandwagon. Gotcha. And I think a lot but of with other all the other benefits and all the bonuses or the you know sort of bargaining, sure. then it kind of makes financial sense for them. Yeah, if they don't have to pay the the marketplace fees, then you you, you know they can use the the just the driver component, the mm -hmm. delivery component of Uber Eats for their um, if if you order on their app and if you order sorry, on the Sweet Green app, and if you order on the Uber Eats app, they're not paying uh, a commission. They're probably just paying for the for the delivery fee. Gotcha. So um, that's a much better, I mean, there is there is a cost of doing delivery, right. right? And just the problem is when you get to the 30%, okay. and it's my main channel, then we have a problem because it's not, it was designed in a way where, where restaurants were already presumably operating in, in the black and mm -hmm. um, 
to and making uh, you know decent margin off of their dine-in sales. The yeah. problem is when we eliminate that. Yeah, that's a good Takeout point. becomes the new takeout becomes the new dine-in, right? Because I'm making a hundred percent. I'm making full margin on on those orders. I don't have to pay some mm -hmm. other person other than my landlord and gotcha. my other overhead, but. I mean, I guess, yeah, I'm, I'm really interested in this sort of idea of who is delivery working for and who isn't it working for. And, you know, I think it makes sense that the big companies, you know, the big brands are able to negotiate better terms, you know, and I think you, as a consumer, you probably noticed it too, you know, some restaurants or some chains are only available on one app, right? So I'm assuming that there's mm -hmm. something going on behind the scenes there, you know, where these sure. restaurants are getting, <clears throat> excuse me, an exclusive deal and uh, you know that's a good thing for them so uh but for the ones you know for, i guess for these mom and pop shops where it's not working um you know like you said there is a cost for delivery right i mean they do have to pay you know it sounds like the 30 percent number is a number i've seen thrown out you know most often is that kind of like what the average commissions are and i mean delivery has to be some of that and you know the you know i guess the platform fee has to be other part right yeah so it's you know the generally speaking, it's like 15% marketing and 15% delivery. Okay. And, you know, we can talk about the caps and what that's done to reduce that and, and tier one cities, but, um, that's generally okay. the breakdown. So they're, they're generally charging around 30% and, uh, you know, 15% for delivery, 15% for marketing. And so I guess, you know, for these restaurants that it's not working out, uh, what, what are their options? I guess in my mind, you know, they could try and, you know, deliver themselves, not work with these companies at all. Um, or, you know, I'm curious to know what their options are, because we see this a lot with Uber and Lyft drivers. You know, that's probably one of the top two or three complaints is that the companies take too high of a take rate. And the biggest thing that I always hear pushback from people is that why don't you stop driving or why don't you quit driving and you know we could get into those reasons but we're not talking about uber and lyft drivers today we're talking about food delivery and restaurateurs so i'm going to pose that question mm -hmm. to you if these fees mm -hmm. are so high for the mom and pop shops what are the reasons why um, they're still using them yeah i think it's you know they just don't i think there's just a general lack of um awareness around you know, so why are the people still using them? It's Corona. I think people are in a panic yeah. and they, they don't know what other the solutions are out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, if they really sat down and looked at it and looked at, you know, Grubhub's deferring commissions, if they actually looked at what they're going to owe mm -hmm. coming out of this, like, you know, and, and who's going to be the first lien on all these different, uh, all the, all this debt that, that restaurants are incurring from their landlords and, mm -hmm. and, uh, the now Grubhub, you know, it's just like, are they ever going to be able to pay these things back in the A? And then, um, you know, why are they still doing it there? They, there's a general demand from the consumer that that customer they used to come in and order in mm -hmm. is now stuck at home. So, you know, I've seen restaurants trying to, to push people to call directly. Yeah. I just, I don't think a lot of restaurateurs are thinking about it that well, they're telling everybody right. that they're on all the apps because they want, to be convenient to everyone amidst this very difficult time. Yeah. And I think they, they don't realize that it's like, I'm already engaging with you on Instagram as a brand mm -hmm. and I'm, or I'm already, already on your website. Don't tell me to go and order on your postmates because that's <laughs> yeah. 20 to 30% off the top, just gone. Right. You've already acquired me as a customer. I'm already loyal. Why not just put up a chow now or put up some sort of direct, we, we can dive into yeah, these definitely. other options because um, I'm definitely thinking a lot about it and I'm probably writing about it um, this week. I'm writing a post, I think it's called like the, the modern restaurant stack. Cool. And yeah, we'll, we'll definitely you, dive into those know. other options in a second. But um, yeah. yeah, no, it is interesting as far as, you know, the reasons why they're doing it. I think it, it's actually very similar to a lot of the gig workers is that, that you know, in, in some ways, you know, they may not be understanding some of the debt or some of the deals that they're getting into, um, you know, like the Grubhub example. I think in other ways they may just, you know, I mean, I think a lot of restaurant owners too are restaurant owners. They're not necessarily, you know, marketing experts or, you know, looking into it, uh, from, from the business side of things, I think, um, you know, it really, it, it kind of boils down to a lot of them are not understanding, you know, kind of like what you laid out and the fees and the costs associated with all of that, Be because they are making money. I think most of them are making money off of these apps at the end of the day. It's just not as much money as they want. Right. So, yeah, th and this is an important distinction. And I think some people say losing money. It's not like, restaurants are losing money on delivery. It's just that means that they're not making enough money to cover their operating costs 
to keep their lights on and they're operating at a loss. That's mm -hmm. very different than saying they're losing money in every order. That would mean Grubhub's literally dipping into their pocket right. for every time they sell someone a burger. They're giving people, I mean, if you run the numbers on some of their promotions, they're, um, you know, on, on a $30 order where I used to make $12, mm -hmm. uh, uh, after I account for my food costs, um, they're doing promotions now that the restaurant has to eat and that lowers it down to two dollars on a thirty dollar order, which yeah. is insane. Um, and so now I have to sell enough two dollars, you know, enough of these thirty dollar orders, to pay my staff, to cover my rent, and keep the lights on. Yeah. And uh, you know that just means you have to do an insane amount of volume. And I think this is the piece that restaurateurs miss out on is the idea of incrementality. Mm -hmm. uh, if I've covered my my basic overhead. Now every dollar that comes in is quote unquote incremental. Mm -hmm. But the question, the problem is when a, I haven't, I'm not able to cover my rent. I can't pay, pay my employee. Well, I can't pay my employees. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this is a growing part of my sales and, you know, making, two, I'm netting $2, not even accounting for, yeah. you know, just looking at the variable costs, I'm netting $2 on every $30 order. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that just means you better be selling a lot of these things. And yeah. I do I do think it is cannibalizing a lot of sales because I think a lot of customers who were loyal to those restaurants are going on the apps that they've yeah. been trained on. They they're hungry, they're going on they're going on Postmates. So sure, there's some new people who are trying out different options in their neighborhood and those are quote unquote incremental, right? Yeah. And that's great, but you know, there's a big percentage of your customer base that's basically that you're paying a thirty cent tax on every dollar that they spend and yeah. it's it'd be yeah. nice to not to do that yeah no that's a, a good way of putting it and i think because you know like you said you definitely have your sort of base of loyal customers and if they start shifting over to all of these apps you know it kind of costs you a lot more than the value that the apps are providing and i think a good story that highlighted this i can't remember if i uh, t tweeted uh, dm'd you about this on twitter i know we chat a lot on twitter um but there was a story about how um you know i think uh, what was it grubhub was actually or i guess it's on yelp too but if you know a lot of times they list uh, that on if you go to Yelp, for example, and look up a restaurant, it's not the actual restaurant's direct phone number. And I don't know if it's a lot of cases, but definitely some of the cases, some cities, certain right. times, certain places, whatever it may be. And if you actually place a phone order through Yelp, sometimes Yelp or basically Grubhub gets a cut of that order. And when I saw that, I was like, oh, shit. I, I use Yelp a lot to look up restaurants' phone numbers. I don't do it in Google Maps, and Yelp or Grubhub might be getting a cut every time. Um, so that I think stuff like that is sort of where, for me, it starts to almost be like you know I wouldn't I would say it's almost like being a little nefarious on the part of uh, you know the the apps sometimes. Like they're I don't think they're providing much value in some of these situations. Oh, totally. And and in New York, you know, Grubhub got slapped on the wrist for creating these alias yeah. numbers and it's impossible to know you're going to guess based on the duration of a call that it was an actual pickup order and that you drove them there. Right. Um, seems a stretch. Luckily right? <laughs> it's just these, these come, I mean, Yelp and Grubhub are, are use very similar tactics. I mean, mm -hmm. they basically like hold restaurants hostage, yep. you know, and try to do things on their behalf without them really knowing. Mm -hmm. And they've just kind of destroyed trust and, you yeah period where it's really necessary. Yeah. And I think the unfortunate thing is that like you alluded to a lot of the restaurants that are sort of getting shafted the worst are the mom and pop ones, you know, the independent ones, the ones that don't have the big marketing budgets. You know, I think with the sweet greens, they probably can look at this, you know, and they probably got a bunch of MBA types sitting in their offices in Culver City, you know, looking at this and analyzing, okay, here's exactly what the take rates that we can afford. Here's how much we need them to pay us or charge. So it does seem to put them at a disadvantage. And, you know, I think that obviously a lot of people are starting to recognize this because of you know the work that folks like yourself are doing which i think is great and you know we've seen a few cities now actually pass or you know are looking to pass various bills to limit fees i'll just list off a few here i know san francisco cap delivery fees at 15 percent. i think it these are until the pandemic is over basically um los angeles was at 15 percent. i think new york city was at 20 percent. does that sound right that's correct. So the New York breakdown was 5% on marketing and 15% on delivery mm -hmm. uh, because Grubhub was kicking and screaming about the fact that a lot of restaurants on the Grubhub platform use 
their own delivery drivers. So it would basically mean gotcha. that if it was capped at 15% for delivery, there would be, you know, no revenue for them on all the pickup and everything. And, yeah. um, you know, Caviar, DoorDash, same company, if wave pickup fees, uh, they voluntarily have um, commissions uh, on delivery it's mm. from 30% to 15%. So um, that was good on their part. Okay. I can't. I'm not 100% sure what Uber was doing yeah. before the legislation. And I think, yeah, to definitely to, to, I guess, some of the company's credits that during this pandemic, some of them, you know, I think have come out with announcements. And, you, you know, I think that you have to be, I would say, take a lot of these PR announcements with a grain of salt and really dive in, right? You know, I think Uber yeah. Eats, for example, announced that there were going to be no, you know, they were going to be charging delivery fees on local restaurants. But there are mm -hmm. still, you know, like multiple fees, you know, and, and different things going on, right? Yeah, and I think now that the caps are put in place, you're starting to see what happens as a result. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to lower demand. Yeah, and I think that what might be helpful too is maybe you and I can just walk through just a very simple example. I mean, if I order, let's say I'm a customer, right? And I order from a uh, Sweet Greens and let's for simplicity say that the, the cost of the salad and is, or let's say that, you know, the cost of the salad is $10, right? Typically from there, what am I paying? I'm usually paying what a delivery fee and then a service fee and taxes and a potential tip to the courier. Does that sound right? Yeah, you're paying um, some delivery fee that gets subsidized by that commission that the restaurant's paying, right? And so for, you know, McDonald's and Sweetgreen and Chipotle, et cetera, all the big chains mm -hmm. that they want on there, um, that, you know, these, these delivery platforms are losing money, mm -hmm. most likely on a lot of these orders. Got it. Um, which is why you see, like, you know, they're beating their sales like insane. Mm -hmm. The comps are up. Uh, like just some numbers, Uber Eats gross bookings are up 54% right. in Q1, but they're losing $300 million right. or Grub bookings are up 9% losing $33 million mm -hmm. and they're going to lose 42 million. So, um, they're, they're losing money on the QSRs. They're making all the profit, uh, from some uh, of the, the little guys. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, they're I guess, not making any profit right, at the end of the day. Yeah, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like they're really heavily subsidizing, you know, the high volume QSRs. And then for the mom and pops, they're sort of, you know, kind of taking the most from them, right? So if my total, you know, if I'm as a customer, right, if I'm handing $15 over to uh, DoorDash, for example, and 10 of that goes to the salad, and then $5 of that goes to the delivery fee and the service fee and, you know, the taxes, for example, there's also an additional tip. I think it's just interesting because at the end of the day, like you said, right? I mean, there's, you know, what's unique about in this case is that there's a customer, there's a restaurant, and then there's also this third party app involved. So it can get pretty confusing pretty fast. And so I'm curious to get your take on, you know, I think most cities are sort of looking to this 15 to 20% fee cap model. In general, what are your thoughts on this good or bad idea? I mean, I think it's obviously much needed for restaurants. I just think the problem is, so like, let's take Jersey City, for example, I saw a tweet the other day. Mm -hmm. where the the restaurant was in Jersey City, so it had to, um, the customer had to pay an extra $3 than they normally would have had to, and the radius uh, for the restaurant was significantly reduced, so they were getting fewer customers. And this is a place it, where they capped the fees at 15%? Yeah. Okay. So... Um, this is kind of the problem. It's like, okay, right. you want us to operate, you know, basically, uh, the, you, you, you won't want us to make any money on these, these orders. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to basically optimize it for our drivers so they can, they, you don't have to drive out of their way right. to, to deliver something. Think, and yeah, I think that's sort of at the crux of the matter. It's, it's tough because you're sort of, you know, like, I think a lot of people are agreeing that these app companies are taking, too much, you know, too high of a commission, but at the same time, they're not even profitable, right? Like you said, Uber Eats yeah. is taking 30% and it's not like, you know, it's this greedy company. It's just, they're taking 30%, but they're still losing $300 million, which is kind of crazy to, right. to think right. about, right? I mean, if they were taking 50 to 60%, then they would just be breaking even maybe, right? Let's just call it round numbers. And, you know, I think that in with these fee cap situations, you know, the, the end result is, you know, there are some negative effects. I, I guess I'm not convinced that they're 
a positive for really the anyone, the restaurant or the customer. I'm, I'm curious to know if you think there are any winners yeah. in these fee caps, because like you said, right, I, I think that when you cap the fees, basically what you're going to do to the company's perspective is they're going to say, OK, well, we still need to make that money. So we're going to charge the customer extra and we need our network to now be more efficient. So we're going to say, uh, you know, let's say a yeah. smaller delivery radius. So maybe the driver can batch two orders instead of, you know, mm -hmm. having to drive all over the place. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Are there any winners? Um, I mean, so are the, I guess, are these fee caps? It sounds like they're not really working then. Ah. <laughs> uh... It just, it just, it's kind of a thing where we have to see how sensitive the consumer is. Cause mm -hmm. like you're basically baking in the, the cost, the, the full cost of delivery isn't transparent to the consumer today because they're paying, right. you know, a couple bucks on, um, in delivery fee, um, or a service fee. Uh, and the restaurant is subsidizing some of it through their commission. Right. Yeah. And, um, now that that's been externalized, right? We can see that in right. that example. The question is, do consumers, even if on balance they're paying like you know the same amount, but it's just broken out yeah. better? You know, are they going to be, are they going to be like, you know what? I'll just get in my car and, and yeah. pick it up, or are they going to just cancel altogether? You know, yeah. Uh, I think that's there's the jury's still out on that to, to really see what the kind of externalities are to the uh, on the consumer side. I mean, obviously it's it's great for restaurants because the numbers the mm. your margins are much better. Okay, you're right. <laughs> obviously when you have the fees, right? Um when you have a 15% it, cap on fees. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Because that's, you know, if you were going to do your DoorDash is Drive, <laughs> yeah, you 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 do, do DoorDash Drive and Chow now, you still would have to pay um that 15% to to DoorDash to just do the fulfillment and then right. the annual fee to Chow Now. Um, so this is a way for customers, for for, for restaurants to stay on these apps mm. amidst the pandemic. It's a Band-Aid and it's obviously not gonna last. And um, another thing to add is that those, those caps not only um, will sustain through, you know, the emergency order mm -hmm. at the national level, but it will also, in the, continue for a three month period in New York after mm. just because ramping up sales yeah. is going to take some time. And, uh, you know, we're going to be feeling the effects of this for a while. Yeah. So, um, another thing to think about yeah. as well. And well, I think that's interesting because what you said is that, you know, the restaurants really have to understand, okay, now the mark, you know, so I guess the restaurants are, I guess in, in, in a way, the winners of a fee cap, um, but the potential downside is that they could see a lot less demand, right? Because if writers, mm -hmm. or you know, sorry, if customers now have to, you know, actually see what the food costs to be delivered, and I think that's kind of really, you know, from the get go, it's kind of why I've been so bearish on food delivery from day one, is because most orders are, you know, fast food or fast casual, kind of low um, order value, but the actual mm -hmm. cost to get these things delivered, just to pay the workers, you know, and to tip them. And then the service fee is, you know, you don't want to pay like $8 for a $9 burrito, right? <laughs> and so I've always just been very skeptical of, you know, the, the delivery model in that sense. Yeah. And so it's completely broken for the platforms. It's, you know, probably going to negatively impact demand mm -hmm. and the restaurants have been a benefit in the short term, but it's just more, you know, it's just kind of delaying the yeah. problem or it's trying to say, if we just keep everything as it is today, here's gotcha. how we can skate by. And uh, so I've been thinking about what is the model of future, and yeah. I, I think it's pretty clear that we need to remove the number of parties involved here. Yeah. I think and, you're going to see the platforms become landlords. Yeah, and I, I think that's the perfect transition into, you know, the solutions that are out there for restaurants and like, how can we make this work? Because I think that if you look at, you know, there's different models, like I think a lot of people have been pointing to a Domino's, for example, and they're sort of the fully vertically integrated, you know, mm -hmm. they take the order, they make the food, they've got their own delivery drivers, but they've also got a shop, you know, every six blocks in, in place like mm -hmm. LA, right? So not every restaurant has, you know, those network effects. So what are the options? You mentioned, um, you know, a couple of things that I think just might be interesting to define at the start. Um, I, I didn't know this until I talked to you earlier is that I think DoorDash and Postmates both basically have a driver API, right? Where you can tie into their yes. API and just use them for delivery, right? So can you explain how that works and then talk about like the chow yeah. nows? Yeah. So, um, 
to just do delivery, right? Let's just say you don't want to hire your own del- driver staff, mm-hmm. um, your delivery staff, and um, you just want to pay some third party every time an order comes in, regardless of where it comes in, to just fulfill it. You can, hi- you know, use a service like Relay in New York, mm-hmm. which is all bikers, okay. or you can use Postmates API or DoorDash Drive, which is um, also an API. So what that means is that, um, you know, white label ordering platforms like a Chow Now or any other one like Lunchbox, and there, there's a there's a number of them, and they're only going to get bigger. Okay. There's only going to be more of them. They're going to integrate with those kind of options uh, for restaurants, depending on the market, to do that fulfillment, and and ultimately will net out hopefully less. I mean, it'll be a lot less than 30% because you own the customer, yeah. right? They, they landed on your website, right? but you're just paying for the cost of delivery. And the question is, if that becomes a growing part of DoorDash's business or Postmates business, can that even, is that even a viable thing for right. them? Right? Like, well, but uh, that's a whole separate topic, but yeah. that's <laughs> it may what not I would be urge a lot. $8 billion business <laughs> just providing right. delivery, but uh, it does seem like, you know, I think the, a lot of those Basically, I, I don't know. What do you call these solutions where a restaurant kind of owns, you know, the customer or whatever it might be? White label ordering platforms. White label platform ordering platforms. Okay. So I think the, yeah. you know, if you're a small or, you know, more independent mom and pop shop, you kind of benefit more from using a white label platform because you're in effect subsidizing a lot of the bigger chains when you're on a DoorDash, when you're on a Postmates. Um, yep. But the challenge as a mom and pop shop is that you don't have the big brand name. You may not have social media. Mm-hmm. You may not even have an email newsletter, right? Absolutely. And I think that's why you, you'll see you know, Chow now step in to do some of those activities of CR customer relations mm-hmm. management and, and other activities that um, larger chains have, you know, a dedicated team yeah. doing. And I think that it's a real big opportunity for some of these providers to own more of a restaurant's digital footprint and help yeah. them kind of, you know, help, help them find those insights, uncover those insights uh, into their customers and, and, hit them with direct marketing over email or whatever it is. Yeah. Are there any examples of independent restaurants right now that are sort of thriving, that have figured it out or Mm -hmm. any, I guess, basically any tips out there? Yeah. I mean, I have a couple of them here in LA and just from my own experience moving out here recently. Mm -hmm. um, You know, the first is I was just talking to my friend at Moza. So this, this is a pretty high, high end Italian restaurant. They, they operate Cheese Spacca, which is a steakhouse. Mm-hmm. They operate a pizzeria, Pizzeria Mozza, and then they have a, the original sit-down location with um, Osteria Mozza, which is a, just a really great Italian restaurant. Um, the chef is Nancy Silverton, who used to own La Brea Bakery. Mm-hmm. She's pretty savvy. Yeah. She's been in the game forever. Um, so the stat from them is that they, they have a to-go. They've always had like a to-go counter on this block mm-hmm. um, and, in West Hollywood, and that to go place is now doing four to five times what it was normally doing wow. in sales. And that's apparently helping them, you know, it's keeping them in their existing spaces across all these different yeah. storefronts that they had and they're selling items. So they're able to cover all their um, overhead of uh, their rent. It seems, I don't know if they've negotiated with their landlord, right? but um, they seem to be setting record breaking numbers every weekend. And they, they, on top of that, are doing a catering business for events. I said to her, what, what do you mean events? There's no events going on. She said, well, HBO just did like a premiere for its new Max subscription. Okay. And um, I said, and we, and we sent 120 uh, box, uh, food deliveries to all their invitees to this digital premiere. Oh, okay. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Like everyone's sitting at home that normally would have come to an event and they're all getting this like kind of yeah. freebie of a, uh, you know, a delicious meal. And that, hmm. that's cool. And she's like, yeah, we're also doing mother's, we did a mother's day zoom cooking event mm-hmm. that, you know, grossed them tens of thousands of dollars. They sold, hmm. you know, $150 ahead. I mean, this is not for everybody, right? Yeah. It's you go to the store, you pick it up, you pick up a piece of groceries and then you basically cook it Mm -hmm. live with Nancy Silverton over Zoom. Mm. And uh, how many of those can they run? I don't know, but it's 
it's highly profitable. You make 20 grand <laughs> yeah, in one digital day. Digital margins are definitely a lot, a lot higher, right? I mean, so it sounds like they sort yeah. of have higher end, um, you know, customers or, you know, food, a celebrity-ish chef, um, you know, and also I guess just thinking outside the box from a marketing perspective on the on the to-go side, do you sort of know the, the details there? Are they on any of the apps or are they sort of doing it directly like with a white label platform? Uh, I haven't dug too much into their delivery. I know they're on a lot of the apps. Okay. Um, but I think what, what she was telling me, and I think this is important, which was that, you know, people have just kind of shifted instead of going to the sit down restaurant in one of those yeah. three sit down restaurants, they've now shifted to drive, making, making, making the time to, to, to drive out to the to go spot and eating in their car, taking mm. it home and just keeping that ritual intact. And I think that's really powerful because it just shows that, you know, consumers aren't just like suddenly just like just ad adopting completely new behaviors. They want to do the same things that they used to do. They just want to do them in a way that's, you know, safe and, and convenient yeah. for them. And I think they stepped up and met that demand. They took menu items from the pizzeria, from Cheese Baca Steakhouse mm -hmm. and put them on the to-go menu so you can kind of sample across all the different spots that were already there. And so in some ways it's maybe even better because it's like, yeah. you know, almost like, a, it's not a ghost kitchen, but you know, it's kind of that same yeah. virtual food court idea. A few different but, brands under one kitchen. Exactly. And I think that's super smart. And, um, hmm. you know, there's other restaurants that are trying to fight this and trying to think about how they're going to reopen their dine-in. Mm -hmm. And I just think, you, you know, they're in a much better position. Yeah. And that, that's sort of, you know, one of the, the final things I want to talk about with you is some of the trends that you're seeing and, you know, also really your uh, advice, you know, uh, as far as what you think, uh, your insight, what might work best, what might not work as well. You know, like I think dine-in might be a good one to look at because a lot of, you know, places are looking to reopen dining, but at reduced capacity, right? 25 or 50%. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know. Do you think that's the savior that uh, restaurants need right now? Absolutely not. I, I, I don't think it was, I think, I think you really got to run the numbers and say, okay, mm -hmm. here are my assumptions. Here's what I was doing. Let's have those numbers and let's see if those numbers still work with all the servers and all the staff and the back of house and the front of house and think about, will that work? I mean, going into this, we were already at a national average of 46% occupancy, a national mm -hmm. average occupancy. So you're now talking, and, and, and in that case, there were a lot of restaurants that were barely getting by. So right. I don't think it's going to be a great story. I think um, thinking about, you know, how to negotiate with your landlord and then just yeah. do a takeout business and try to think about what your consumer wants from you in yeah. this moment. I mean, it's probably not going to be this like white tablecloth dinner that yeah. you used to sell in your restaurant. I mean, think, you know, the steakhouses that are just going to try to do the same old steakhouse thing is just, it's not going to work. You got to sell, you know, meal kits yeah. or think about ways that people can enjoy that experience from home. Yeah, no, I, I think actually that makes a lot of sense. I think what I'm getting from this conversation is, you know, kind of going forward, what used to work for a lot of restaurants, you know, isn't going to work in the future. I think it was kind of barely working for a lot of people when right. you look at occupancy rates, when you look at margins. I mean, everyone kind of knows I'm not, I mean, you know, I've never owned a restaurant, but everyone sort of knows restaurants are a low margin business, you know, before yeah. the pandemic, right? So after when you have reduced occupancy and you have, you know, I don't know, all of these other issues to deal with, I think that you do need to think outside the box, um, you know, and I think generally, like, look at your expenses, you know, I think a lot of folks have, you know, already started negotiating with their landlords, you know, some that I've talked to have been very understanding. So that's been cool to see. But I think that mm -hmm. It really is, you know, understanding your customer, your consumer. Like I know, you know, recently for uh, Mother's Day, right? I saw some chains or not chains, some local restaurants here in LA doing some cool stuff, like some pickup boxes and some to go, you know, and sort of like allowing mm -hmm. for that celebration still to happen. But okay, you got to come pick it up. And, you know, they're sending out emails in advance. So I think really thinking about, you know, uh, I, I guess like a little outside the box, but also putting yourself in your customer shoes and how they want to enjoy. Because I think a lot of people still want to celebrate mother's day they just you know are going to do it sans the restaurant part you know in the in restaurant yeah i think your your customers aren't gone you just got to figure out how to give them what they what they want mm -hmm. and to your point and um 
Yeah, I just I see so many restaurants clinging on for dear life. I think there's so many opportunities. Like there's a deli that is basically licensing its brand. You know, they created a a secondary virtual concept and they're licensing it to restaurants that need an additional income stream and mm. just getting a royalty on that. And it's a strategy that Cloud Kitchens does with its yeah. facility brand. So really literally think outside the box. Like could you expand your concept into a new rate delivery radius where you knew there was demand, yeah. right? There's latent demand. And that's only going to work if you've actually built that brand, right? right? Like if you operate all the West side, but there's awareness of your brand on the East side or vice versa, yeah. could you get it to that consumer without investing a dollar? You just yeah. basically form in a partnership with some other restaurant. And you're going to see this with, yeah. with uh, liquor, by the way, because like all the bars in order to open, right. reopen, they have to partner with some sort of food service provider mm -hmm. that's been doing it. So uh, bars will have to partner with restaurants to get you know, pre-prepared food or something they can easily heat, reheat yeah. and sell it with alcohol or they're not going to be able to sell on the street, you know, sell to go roadies. Yeah. And I'm even thinking, you know, if you were, let's say in, in Los Angeles and, you know, kind of a famous West side restaurant and you had, you know, maybe not like a hot steaming meal that you want to deliver to the East side, but maybe it was like something that you can kind of reheat that, you know, reheats well, right? So maybe less, you know, no French fries, but more, you know, kind of like pre-cooked meats or, you know, stews or something like that. Right, yeah. that you could then you know deliver maybe even a day in advance, right? Because then that starts to allow you to use your employees to batch orders and things like that. I think you really have to understand you know what are your strengths in times like these. And you you have mentioned you know ghost kitchens a couple times, and you know that was the original topic that we chatted on all the way back. I want to say it was episode one hundred six when I had you on. <laughs> I think we chatted about ghost kitchens. So if people are interested in learning about ghost kitchens, they can check out that episode. But you know I would assume that. Um, in times like these, it kind of plays to the strengths of ghost and virtual kitchens. What, what have you seen? Yeah, I, I think yes and no. I think some of them have um, unfortunately shuttered. Uh, in New York, uh, there's two companies that have basically sh closed their doors. Why was that? Um, I think there's they were servicing um, areas of low, you know, lower Manhattan and Tribeca mm. and Soho gotcha. that were just completely Lunch hour vacated. busy Everyone. during the week, office hours yeah. type stuff. Okay. Yeah, that would yeah. hurt. Yeah, and also all the residents nearby would just, you know, completely vacated the city. Anybody who could left and, um, you know, they were servicing a, a higher end customer. So that's kind of out the window. Here in LA with Cloud Kitchens, I think, um, you know, I've heard across the board that Kitchen United and Cloud Kitchens have basically gone from $100,000 a year in rent to 60000 to try to sweeten the deal for some people. So, mm -hmm. That tells me that there's definitely some vacancies that have recently happened, and I think it's because, um, you know, you're pa packing people like sardines into these spaces with mm. like 30 kitchens, and they're each 200 square feet. That's true. So the the restaurant that used to have three people can only do two people in a kitchen, or. Mm. Yeah, you I know, guess that sort of works against uh, the ghost kitchens in this scenario, right? Because they need more, you know, yeah. usually they're packing them in there. That's kind of their value add, right? That we put a lot of right. people in small places, but in this situation, yes. it works against them. Um, interesting. But that being said, you know, I spoke to a restaurateur the other day who was about to open their brick and mortar first fast casual kind of concept. It was like a healthy, you know, comfort food of Ita healthy comfort Italian food, but it was all made out of vegetables. Mm. Um, and they were about to launch, uh, you know, a real, they spent a year looking for a, a location. I mean, mm -hmm. real estate is really tough, yeah, especially in tier one markets. And you know, they basically never settled on, on a lease and they were like, you know, we'll, we'll just, before we sign a lease on an actual location, let's test it out in cloud kitchens. Yeah. And so they were just spot right on the money, right on the trend. And, and they were able to get the, all their investors to like beta test their product for a month over delivery, tweak it and then launch without, you know, basically committing to a, to a one year lease on something that they would have had to renegotiate anyway. So people who were thinking about coming into this industry who now have this option, are are in a much better place. Anyone with an you know existing overhead of all yeah. this rent that operates a massive dining room, unfortunately, has to get out of this hole, and it's a much different conversation for those folks. So I think it just depends who you talk to. Some people are going to love it. Some yeah. people are going to just say it's still too expensive, and that the thresholds for you know doing it as a mom and pop are still hard. Um, you know, I do think there's just going to be a ton of consolidation. Yeah, I think you're going to have like 
different hospitality companies that operate multiple brands create even more virtual brands and mm -hmm. then just deploy them on in these ghost kitchens and all this kind of ghost retail that's already out there. You don't need to sign in at least, you know, paying, you know, 60 to 100K in a ghost kitchen and on top of that, yeah. outfit it with all the equipment. You could actually just go into, you know, a nightclub that just can't mm -hmm. open and make sushi out of it, which is, you know, some of these people are doing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. No, I, I, I don't know. This is totally random, but uh, I was watching Shark Tank the other week and there was a company on there called Salted that actually pitched yes. on the tank. Uh, did you happen to see that episode? I, I'm assuming you know who they are. <laughs> I, I'm i very familiar with them. Um, you know, I wrote about them the other week. They're, you know, they're a good example of, I think, you know, what we're going to see restaurant groups of the future look mm -hmm. like. I think you have a constellation of brands. They have, I think, five brands. Right. And it's, I, a lot of them are funnily enough, like doing healthy versions of comfort food. Right. You know, they're, they're doing this like vegan ish. Pizza, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you still using dairy and a lot of the stuff and sometimes you can get vegan stuff, but it's like this consumer who will eat beef, but they won't eat butter. Mm. They, you know, like it's people who are, um, people have all these weird, um, you know, food eating quirks. dietary preferences. <laughs> Dietary preferences, yeah. and I think you know it's it's a younger generation that wants to, you know, kind of have the best of everything. They want you yeah. know comforting pizza and pasta and that's burgers, healthy. but they want it to be quote unquote healthy. And that's you know we can come take this full circle and come back to the fungi because right? <laughs> I think the fungi are a lot healthier than Beyond and Impossible. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of this comes down to marketing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting. Well, you know, I think I've uh, taken enough of your time and we could probably go on for hours about uh, these yeah. issues that uh, restaurants are facing with the apps. But <laughs> really appreciate you coming on uh, for the second time, Matt. And uh, people want to learn a little bit more about your work. Check out your new uh, fungi video. Where should they go? Where, where can they find you? Where should they follow you? Absolutely. Yeah. Check out hungry.tv. It's hungry with no you. So uh, I have a newsletter I put out once a week and um, there's going to be a new product called hungry trends so be on the lookout for that it's gonna be the new subscription product there'll be a mix of video and audio and and writing from yours truly cool very cool matt well uh, appreciate it and uh, we'll uh, you know i definitely know who to call when i have uh, food uh, food or tech questions in the future take care okay thanks you too